Hello, everyone, and welcome. It is February the 11th, Sunday. Uh, my name's Glenn Rawson. Welcome to our devotional. At the present moment, I am sailing between Sydney, Australia, and the Northern Island of New Zealand. Actually, we're going back towards Sydney after spending a few days touring around the islands of New Zealand and especially the fjords. It is absolutely gorgeous down here. If you have never been to Australia and taken this cruise with Fun for Less Tours, you really should come. Beautiful ship, beautiful islands. We have had so much fun. And I've traveled with 137 of the most wonderful people. Been a great time. Uh, I just wanted to also remind you that uh, coming up with Fun for Less Tours in May, I have a church history tour that's coming from um, back from um, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, all the way back to Nauvoo. And then I've also got a British Isles tour, a land tour that's going in August. So if that's something you'd be interested in, either one of those are still available. Have a few seats on them. Now, as always, my friends, I ask you to have a prayer in your heart for me and for you. This first story. A long time ago, the Lord said through Isaiah, Hearken unto me, ye that follow after righteousness. Look unto the rock from whence ye are hewn, and to the hole of the pit from whence you are digged. Look unto Abraham, your father, and unto Sarah, she that bear you. For I called him alone and blessed him. Isaiah 51, 1 and 2. Think about it. The Lord is saying, look back to your ancient father and mother and live as they did. Well, in a manner of speaking, as chips off the ancient block of Abraham and Sarah, how are we doing? Are we as dedicated as they were? Here's a story just for that. A few years ago, Right near the end of my career, college career at BYU, I had a wildlife behavior class. Loved that class. Dr. Jaron Flinders taught it. It was a great class. And for a semester project, two of us decided that we wanted to go out into the wilds and really study wildlife. We took on the project of studying the foraging patterns of porcupines. <laughs> Don't laugh. We, we thought this was cutting edge science. We were really out to learn something. Besides that, it got us out of the building. Well, we, we drove up into the mountains and we found a porcupine in a tree. It's winter time. And according to the instructions that we had received, we shook him out of the tree, out of a scrub oak tree, not very far up, and dropped him into my coat. Now, pincushion doesn't even begin to describe what that porcupine did to my jacket, but suffice it to say, I could never wear it out that after that. We let Porky fall out of my coat onto the ground and he took off running, of course. Well, uh, porcupines aren't particularly speedy, or agile. So we ran him down and with a trick we had learned from our professor, uh, which I don't recommend you try at home. We stepped on his tail, grabbed him by the tail, picked him up, flipped him over onto his back, and then dusted his belly with luminescent pink powder. Just like you would salt and pepper a steak, I guess. We powdered him with this baby powder stuff and then let him go. Well, of course, Porky just toddled off. Well, we, we got pretty good at this. Uh, on one occasion, however, the porcupine got away and my friend got a quill stuck in his leg that eventually went all the way through and came out the other side a few months later. Well, after the dusting of the porcupine, of course, we let him go. And and he went off, and after he settled down, he went about his foraging. We came back that night with the portable blacklight, 
and we followed his shining trail, blue, sometimes pink. Uh, we followed his trail all through the snow, mapping everywhere he went, what he did, and what he nibbled on. Can you just picture it? Two grown men on their hands and knees in deep snow, crawling around through everything in the middle of the night that a porcupine might waddle through. And I can tell you that they can go through some pretty tight, uh, tight places. What were we doing? Trying to figure out what Porky thought was interesting, what he thought was worth eating. I, again, chubby little porcupines can get into some pretty tight places. We did this sleep deprivation project day after day, week after week. And at the semester's end, we put all of our data together. And guess what we learned? Nothing. We determined after all of that, that a porcupine goes where he wants, eats what he wants, does what he wants, and winds up absolutely wherever he feels like it. He is a creature of whim with no purpose higher than his appetite. I still laugh at myself over that venture. Most people in this, of this world, if you think about it, are a lot like porcupines. Some people don't live on, on any plane higher than their appetites. They are not, they are not going where you want to go. Follow the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only way to permanent happiness. Don't give up. Those few who firmly follow Jesus take flight. They mount up with wings as eagles while the rest of the world grubs with porcupines and goes nowhere. This next story comes from an old enzyme story that I pulled out many years ago. It struck me and it still does. I share it with you now. I have a conviction that I occasionally have to remind myself of. It is that God will not do anything to us or for us that is not calculated at the very end for our benefit. Sometimes that help doesn't come the way we would expect or when we would expect, as this story illustrates. It had been a hard winter, and it was not over yet. It was January, and it was Wyoming, need I say more. The snow was piled up to the eaves of the porch and packed tight. The barn doors were drifted shut, and the pasture fences had long since disappeared beneath the snow. The snow machine had become the only way left for the family to feed the horses. Late one evening, Wendy received a phone call saying that her horses were out and that they were on the railroad tracks. Her husband was at work. Wendy quickly bundled up, grabbed a scarf and a helmet, and went off to find the horses. She searched. But she couldn't find them. Then, thinking that maybe they had returned to their pasture on the other side of the tracks, she decided to cross the tracks. She gave the sled full throttle and started to cross. Now, up to this time, the tracks had been packed down with snow so that crossing had not been a problem. But in the darkness, Wendy failed to notice that the snow had melted back, exposing the rails. She slammed to a sudden stop with the sled fully across the tracks and the skis wedged under the rail. Frantically, she jumped off and attempted to pull the machine off the tracks, all the while praying, help me, Heavenly Father, help me. She pulled and pulled 
and looked all the while for a train and then pulled some more. And then it occurred to her, if a train came around that corner, she would never hear it in time. She tore off the helmet and reached for the sled again when suddenly the, uh, the light of an oncoming freight train rounded the corner and fell upon her. Then very distinctly, a voice came into Wendy's mind and it said, you have three children at home. Get off the tracks. Turning, Wendy began to run, fearing that the speeding train would throw the machine sideways and hit her. She ran as hard as she could and looked back just as the monster behemoth hit the sled, throwing it like a child's toy 150 yards down the tracks. Stunned and in shock, Wendy couldn't move or react. Then try trembling and crying, she walked numbly home, oblivious to the biting temperatures. The next day, a sober and grateful family went out to look. They found pieces of the machine scattered everywhere, and nothing left of that sled but a twisted piece of junk. Of her experience, Wendy said, I know our Heavenly Father answers prayers. I also know that our prayers are not always answered in the way we expect. My prayer for help did not allow me to save the snow machine, but it did save my life. End of quote. I hope and pray, my dear friends, that you and I will have the faith to accept without murmuring however God chooses to answer our prayers and whenever he chooses to answer them and how he chooses to teach us. Now, this story is a little close to home for me at the moment. I just came from New Zealand, particularly Taranga, New Zealand. And I've known this for a long time, but I guess it came a little closer to home. This is where Matthew Cowley served as a missionary and later as a mission president. He was one of the most influential missionaries ever to serve in that beautiful land. This profound story happened to him as a brand new missionary to New Zealand. I will quote how he recorded it. On one occasion, while standing on the sidewalk in front of a store, he said, an old Maori man came up to me. He tried to give me a coin, a two and sixpence worth about 50 cents. Well, at that moment, I had $50 in my pocket, which was enough for me to live on for three months. I did not need his money. He tried to give it to me. He didn't speak any English, and I did not know any Maori. But I could tell that he was trying to give me this money. I finally sent him on his way. When my companion came out, I said, see that old Maori man walking down there? He tried to give me some money. He said, what did you do? I said, I don't need it. I don't want it. I probably got 10 or 20 times more money than he's got. Elder Dastrup then said to me, go on down the street run down and get a hold of him and tell him to give you the money. So, reluctantly, I did. When I got to him, I held out my hand. End of quote. And what happens next is the reason I tell you this story. Elder Cowley continued. As he gave me the coin, I saw tears come to his eyes. I realized it was something special to him. I think he saw in me a young Pakiha or Caucasian boy, I can't say it right. I think he saw in me more than I thought I was. I was a servant of the Lord. 
he was giving me his last money, knowing that the Lord would bless him and pour out great blessings upon him because he was good to a humble servant of the Lord. And then Elder Cowley concludes, that day I began to fall in love with the great Maori people of New Zealand. I learned what it meant to let somebody do something for you that they wanted to do, end of quote. We love those we sacrifice and pray for, and we sacrifice and pray for those that we love. Let's take a break. How are you doing? Are you okay? I pray that the Spirit of the Lord is with you and that you are happy. Coming up this summer, I have three tours with my friend, Dennis Lyman. In June, we're going to go across the trail, the Pioneer Trail, Salt Lake to Nauvoo, and again from Nauvoo back to Salt Lake. We'll do that in June and again in September. If you've never been on that trail and felt the power and spirit of the trail, come with us. I'd love to have you. Then in July, Michael Wilcox and I are excited about this tour. It is the Old West and Cowboy Tour. We're going to take you out across the American West, all the way to Mount Rushmore, and then back. And we're going to teach you about the settlement of the West, the, the old-time cowboys, the way of the cowboy, the trappers, the fur traders, the forts, even probably take you to see a rodeo. If you would like to come on any of these three tours, the trail tours or the cowboy tour, go to historyofthesaints.org. You are invited to come, and it will be fun. In those moments when we are alone and suffering on the road of life, thank the Lord for those he sends to walk with us. Those who come into our lives like good Samaritans and bind up our wounds and help us get along. This is one of those moments. Young Joseph had allowed Martin Harris to take the manuscript of the Book of Mormon, thus far completed, back to Palmyra, the manuscript, to show it to his family. You know that story. That manuscript at the time comprised the Book of Lehi. Martin had left June 14, 1828, going from Harmony, Pennsylvania, back to Palmyra promising to show it to only a few people and to quickly return. Following day, June 15th, Emma delivered her first baby, a little boy, who lived only for a short time. Emma's life was in danger. She seemed to tremble on the verge of the silent home of her infant. So uncertain seemed her fate for a season that in the space of two weeks, her, her husband never slept one hour in undisturbed quiet, end of quote. Joseph watched over Emma day and night to save her life. As the days passed, Joseph became increasingly anxious about the manuscript, having heard nothing from Martin. Finally, after three weeks, Emma asked Joseph to go to Palmyra and get the manuscript. Quote, after much persuasion, he concluded to leave his wife in the care of her mother for a few days and set out on the before-mentioned journey. But the sensations which he experienced when he found himself well-seated in the stagecoach, left to the solitude of his own imagination, cannot be imagined by anyone who reads this, for they have not, have not been in like circumstances. End of quote. In other words, as Joseph traveled north in the sage stagecoach, a terrible feeling came over him. Mother Smith said, quote, 
Joseph awfully feared that he had ventured too far in vouching for the safety of the manuscript after it was out of his possession. Perhaps he might never have the privilege of touching a finger to the work, which until now he had been the blessed instrument in the hands of God of bringing to the knowledge of mankind, end of quote. You see where Joseph sat? Doubts crept in. Had he gone too far in trusting Martin, in letting that manuscript out of his hands? I can comprehend. Joseph was stressed, under pressure, young, inexperienced. Martin was older, persuasive. But now, oh, what if I made a mistake? Had he gone too far? Had he sinned too much? Had he pushed too hard? Joseph neither ate nor slept on the stagecoach that night. There was only one other passenger on the stage who up to this point had said very little. When Joseph got off the stage and commented to the strangers that he had yet 20 miles to walk, the stranger said this to him, quote, I have watched you since you first entered the stage. And I know that you have not slept nor eaten since you commenced your journey. And you shall not go on foot 20 miles alone this night. For if you must and will go, I will be your company. End of quote. The stranger got off with him and asked Joseph why he was in such a bad way. He listened as Joseph told him of the death of his firstborn son and how he rightly feared that he might not return and find his wife alive. Can you imagine? Together they walked on through the night. Mother Smith, Lucy Max Smith, records, quote, Four miles of distance the stranger was under the necessity of leading Joseph by his arm, for nature was too much exhausted to support him any longer, and he would fall asleep as he stood upon his feet. End of quote. They arrived at the Smith Farm in Manchester just before daylight. The stranger said, quote, I have brought your son through the forest because he insisted on coming, but he is sick and wants rest and refreshment, end of quote. He asked them, the stranger, to care for Joseph and then said kindly, I will thank you for a little breakfast as I am in haste to be on my journey again, end of quote. Joseph was cared for. The stranger was given a bit of breakfast, and Mother Smith said, The stranger left, whose name we never knew. End of quote. That story has always touched me. Thank the Lord for friends and strangers who have been there when I needed them. But more importantly, thank the Lord for people like you who are those strangers on the road for someone else. The Almighty referred to Moses as my son. When the devil came, he called Moses son of man. Does it really matter who's Moses, who Moses' father really is? I believe it does. It matters a great deal whose son or daughter you are. It was the fall of 1976, and my first semester in college at Idaho State University in Pocatello. I had just left the ranch. It was my first time out on my own, and I was sitting in a freshman English class 
when the instructor asked us to write a paper with this thesis, and he popped it out there, quote, man, the highest form of life on earth or the lowest, end of quote. Wow, what a thesis. I scarcely hesitated. I chose to write my paper on man, the lowest form of life. And oh, I wrote my paper and I defended my position. In my defense at that time, yeah, please understand, I wasn't a Christian. Didn't know anything about it. I knew nothing of God and less of his doctrine. My formative years, as I've told you, were on the ranch, hunting, fishing, cowboying, running trap lines. I was just a redneck kid from the ranch. I had spent countless hours attuned to Mother Nature and the abuses heaped upon the natural systems by the rapacious greed of men and corporations. Oh, I'm telling you, I had very strong opinions, all right. I turned in that paper, and as I recall, I think I got a decent grade, but strangely, I felt very guilty. I felt that I'd done something terribly wrong, but for the life of me, I didn't know what it was. How badly I felt is reflected by the fact that I so vividly remember that paper. One out of hundreds I would write in my college career. A few months later, the course of my life was changed. I was baptized and began to search the scriptures. For the first time in my life, I began to pray and search for God for myself. I suppose that that is what set the stage for the story I share with you now. It was a warm, sunny day, the summer of 1977, just a few months after my baptism. I went over to visit one of my friends. Her name was Emma. We were sitting in the living room of her apartment she sat right over here across the room to my left, and we were just casually chatting. I remember that the conversation had nothing to do with what happened next. It came suddenly out of nowhere, filling my mind and my heart with light and warmth, a voice that was more like a feeling spoke softly but powerfully, you are a son of God. And it seemed to course through me. I was thrilled and filled with joy that lasted for days. I wanted to shout it out. I am a son of God. Heaven loves me course, people would have thought I was crazy. That day changed me forever. I had not prayed for that. I didn't even know that such a knowledge was to be known. Yet from that day forward, I knew who I was, and I comprehended what I was and it made all the difference. I am God's son. He knows me. He loves me. And now I understood why I felt so guilty with that paper. We are not the lowest forms of life. We are not evolutionary accidents. We are sons and daughters of Almighty God. He is our Father. Yes, men behave imperfectly, sometimes even cruelly, but when they know who they are, 
when they know what they really are. At once, prayer becomes instinctive and perfection becomes their destiny and potential, their inheritance. I believe we can't go home until we really learn who we are and from whence we came. Last story for tonight. Joseph Long King Townsend was born in Canton, Pennsylvania in 1849. In 1872, he immigrated to Utah. No, not because he joined the church, but because he went out there for his health. After he arrived in Utah, he joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Not long after that, 1875, he married Alta Maria Hancock, and eventually to them were born 11 children. In 1875, Brother uh, Townsend was called to go to Payson, where he was supposed to open up a high school. While there, he also, not in addition to being the principal of the high school, he also operated a drugstore for many years. Joseph Townsend served as a small town educator and druggist most of his life. He passed away in Provo, Utah in 1942. What most people don't know is that Joseph Long King Townsend was also a spiritually gifted man. Before he passed away, Brother Townsend left this account, and I quote it verbatim. Since I became a member of our church in January 1873, I have been instructed in my faith with many gifts of the Holy Spirit, and among these have been many remarkable dreams and visions. It was after a wondrous vision of the advent of our Savior that I wrote the lines describing the events in the order therein presented. And then he continues by relating the vision. Quote, The vision placed me on a wild, open prairie with no buildings or improvements in view. The time seemed to be early summer, for the abundant flowers were in bloom. With me was a group of church officers, all in the usual apparel of present fashion and without banners, flags, or other insignia. Yet we were all aware of the great events soon to be displayed. A solemnity prevailed that hushed all conversation, and our group of brethren was intently gazing at the great masses of brilliant clouds approaching from the eastern horizon. When this wondrous pageant reached the zenith, our group of brethren saw angels and saints within this glorious sheen of vapor while it settled down till just above us. Then, one whom we recognized by his glorious and majestic appearance descended and joined our group, who were all officers of the holy priesthood. The long-expected king and savior greeted us. He called us by name and embraced and gave a holy kiss to the brow of each brother while he gave to each the boon of the comforter, the assurance of celestial glory. This was our reward of approval. My brethren were filled with an ecstasy of joy and from the heavenly host above came the songs of joy that announced again on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Brother Townsend continued, the wondrous vision closed. Awakened in the mortal sphere again, I felt the superb thrills of happiness that few men have ever attained. 
As a lesson in life's progress, it has ever been retained in memory. As a comforter, it has blessed and sustained me for over half a century. End of quote. Can you imagine the effect such a vision as that would have upon your life? Well, it affected Joseph Townsend. In addition to the gifts this man exercised, one of those was as a poet, a lyricist, and a hymnist. It is he who wrote these hymns for our hymn book. The day dawn is breaking, hope of Israel, oh, what songs of the heart, and choose the right. My dear friends, I pray that you are well, that the power of the Holy Ghost is with you, and the power of the Savior's atonement is active in your life. Good night, and God bless.